Hey, it's Matt Pinfield, and this show is called In a Lonely Place. Um, as I say every day, it's because I live alone. You know, we're practicing social distancing, and, uh, you know, obviously we miss the people we love. We like to be next to them. Man, I just like to be next to somebody in a restaurant or anywhere. But, you know, the thing that's getting us through is staying in touch with the people we love and the music that is so important to us. In a Lonely Place was a song by the Smithereens with Suzanne Vega, uh, based on a Humphrey Bogart movie from 1950. That's why I named it that way. But um, I'm really excited because we're doing this now five days a week. And my guest today is, uh, I mean, we're, we couldn't be closer. We're like, we're brothers, really. I mean, I, sometimes when I'm in Jacksonville, I stay, when I, I would stay at his house and we just, we took this journey together. So I'm so happy. One to say that the latest album, The Things We Can't Stop, is, is so amazing. And he's got the number one active rock record in America right now with Breaking Benjamin. So I thought it'd be a perfect time to catch up with one of my favorite people in the world, Scooter Ward. Scooter, what's up, man? Hey, brother. How are you? Yeah, man, I'm good, man. I'm just so happy to see you. You know, I was thinking about when you and I met when I first interviewed you, when M2 was like, and actually Jacksonville was one of the few uh, places that actually carried it in the very, very beginning. Um, and you, we all met, we were waiting to go to this place called, was it Barmacy? The place that like was the weird, like, or was it the one that was like the barbershop? Because there were these two bars in New York City on 14th Street. And one was, had all these fucking bizarre, um, like they actually had them in glass, weird medications. Like the, you know, in St. Augustine, you know, they have those in like the old drugstore there. And all yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Like, like meat, blood, <laughs> just the most bizarre shit. You know. You no, know, I don't remember what place out, like, we were going to that night. Um, I was probably feeling pretty good at that point by the time we decided on where to go. So yeah, I mean, we were. Um, it was like. But we, the interview was like 10, 11 in the morning. We yeah. got there, man. We, we were all sitting on the street. And it was kind of cool because 14th Street in New York City is never that quiet. Yeah, right. But, like, you know, we, but we were there and it was just, it wasn't insane. So it was a really cool way to meet you. Yeah. And our friendship has taken us all over, man. And yeah. you. Um, I mean, yeah, we're, I don't think people understand how close we are. Like you've eaten. You, in my parents' house, we kind of you stayed at my place for a long time. Like, uh, yeah, man, I stayed at your place. Your mom and dad, is, you know, and your sister. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, you know, and that's uh, that's you when you love your friends, that's what it's about. You know what I mean? So, for that, and that's our Jacksonville connection. I was and I was thinking recently, like that millions thing that's on right now about all about the whole like scam of stealing the millions of dollars because of the like the monopoly game pieces. Have you seen that thing? I haven't seen like, that yet. It's crazy. It's on. It's on HBO. But I, I will just quickly say that that FBI uh, building. I would drive by it all the time to take. Oh, great! I started watching that. It was the FBI located in Jacksonville. Yeah, I saw yeah. It. I was like, oh, wait, that figures. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it's amazing. Scooter man, Cold has had an, an amazing run and is still doing so much. And nothing you know, could do my heart better than you having a number one record right now. Yeah. And, you know, and that's really about the relationship you have with people, like like with Ben from Breaking Benjamin and doing yeah. that thing. But talk to me about how you got into music in the first place. Cause I, but I know because I know you like so many different things that I uh, yeah, so you know, music for me, man. I, when I first started getting into music, it was I was really little, I, I was like four or five, and my mom used to watch soap operas as she was doing housework and stuff. Soap operas would all be on, always be on the TV in the afternoon. Yeah. And, uh, there was something so beautifully tragic about the soap opera melodies that they played at the beginning. Like, for some reason, they had the perfect songs, you know, just the piano work. And so we had a piano in the house, and I started playing, I started mimicking the songs, trying to play the songs, and I'd learn them all, learn all the soap operas songs and uh just, i think the reaction that i got off of that you know from people coming over and being like play that song it was a thing and it just carried on and it made me want to perform with people um so piano was the first thing i started and then my next door neighbor gave me a guitar and sam mccandless our drummer 
he lived a couple blocks away from me and he was like the dopest drummer in Jack's Beach, right? And he's this real cool kid. Uh, you know, we neither one of us had a lot of friends, but I would always skateboard by his house every afternoon because I'd hear the drums he'd be playing in his garage. And I'd skateboard by his house and just hoping he would say something to me like, hey, kid, what's up? You know, we could be friends. Uh, and one day, we, I think we were at school or something, and he came up and he was like, hey, man, you got a guitar? And, and I was like, yeah, I just got one. And I, I didn't know how to play anything. The first songs, I, the only song I knew how to play was like a two string lead from I Will Follow by U2. Yeah. And, uh, that was it. <laughs> Not a bad first thing. Yeah, such but I was so intimidated because he was so such a good drummer. And um, we finally went over there and we started playing stuff and we'd play old cult covers, things like that. And we just kind of started from there, you know, started playing parties. And the first band we were ever in was called Six Gun. And the most hilarious thing was we had two guitarists and Sam and a singer. And we didn't even have a bass player. And we honestly didn't care or even acknowledge that we needed a bass player. <laughs> we had played a couple parties and everybody was going crazy. Pits were starting. People were having a great time and it just kept growing. And then somebody came up to us one night and was like, hey, you know, it'd be great if you guys got a freaking bass player. It'd help a lot. We were like, oh, yeah. That'd be a good <laughs> hey, the Doors, you know, they, they had bass players on their albums, but they, yeah. you know, they never had one live, you know. Yeah. You know, so I, that's when Jeremy came in and, um, you know, that kind of all just that, that, that was the missing piece. That's when we were like, oh, my God, I can't believe we've been doing this for a year and a half with no bass player. Um, so it was funny. But we were young kids from Jack's Beach and 13. So, you know, you know we, we the amazing thing is like when you think about our friends like Damon Starkey and, you know, those guys, like Bobby and everybody starts really young in Jack's. Like, it's all about music. It's, it's always been an amazing music town, man. Like yeah. people don't realize the classics for it, who did Traces, Spooky, Stormy, all those great songs back in the sixties. Um, we're from Jack's obviously. And, you know, Skinner, of course, you know, and then yeah. Big, of course took off, but there was, you know, yeah. there are friends obviously, but it, uh, it blows me away. You know, that it's, it's been this really warm town for music. You know what I mean? Um, well, at the same time, you know, it has a competitive thing, like everywhere else, right? So you know, it was it was it was never as competitive as, as I think bigger cities, but it, it was a thing. You know, everybody always just kind of joined in to play shows together, and I I don't think the competition started till we got a little older, till we were like in our you know early twenties or something like that. That's when everything started yeah. a little more serious, yeah. but uh, it was all good fun, man, the whole time. You know? Yeah, I mean, I love I love that city, and I you know I just feel like you're you know I, obviously I have the family there, and you're my family, and yeah. but, you know it's just uh, it's got an incredible history. Yeah, it was awesome, man. It was a great great place to grow up. So, talk to me about how you ended up making your first record. Like, what was the what was the catalyst to doing that? Well, and um, okay, so we had gotten you know we had been we had moved to Atlanta from Jacksonville to kind of take over that scene we wanted to go there and you know be as do as well as we did in florida so we get to atlanta and it turned out you know that was around the rem days and stuff and the cool place to play was in five points in atlanta and uh so we just figured you know we played everywhere in jackson well, we could just go get a show here so we go to get a show and we were way too sound garden -y grunge for that type of scene so they didn't really want us to play there we kind of had a hard time getting shows we it took us months like we would play like shows where there was nobody there i remember one show we were playing and the, the dude was literally there was one person there and it was the guy sweeping the floor like uh, oh know. man so, it, it, it was like a rite of passage for bands yeah. like going through that it thing. happened so much back then that we got so you know, we started just going, okay, if this is going to happen, then we're just going to use it as a practice in a different arena for us. You know, it's like, we're just, we're practicing for the big shows one day. So we didn't take offense to it and we just kept doing it. And, you know, slowly things built and built and became better. It, the funny thing about the Atlanta situation was because they wouldn't really allow us to play in five points at the time is they put us at this place out in uh, Buckhead or one of those areas or... Uh... Further than Buckhead. It was like out in Norcross. Marietta? 
or something like that? Or yeah, it? kind of Marietta. And it was called Magruder's. And we started playing with this band every weekend called Crawl Space. And it was Seven Dust. Yeah. And, and, and I said that. So great guys. We were a heavier band. They were a heavier band. So we would play with them often on the weekends. And it just became, that was our jam. We'd play there on the weekends. And, you know, eventually we got to play the shows and five points and things started doing well. And we had a good time. And it was a great experience for us. However, I had gotten sick there with Crohn's disease, but uh, 25 years old and started getting really sick. And I couldn't move. And I was, uh, I, I, you know, I didn't really know what I was going to do with my life. I, I became so sick that I just kind of laid down. I got an apartment and I thought I was going to die. So I just kind of went away. I quit the band and kind of hit out just thinking, okay, the doctors couldn't find out what was wrong with me. Back then, Crohn's disease wasn't as big a deal as it is now. Now it's not as, there wasn't a lot of studies on it. So they were wondering what was going on. Um, and so... I kind of sat in that apartment thinking I was just going to die. And then my parents flew out from Jacksonville, got me. They saw how sick I was. They took me back home. Um, I had gotten back there. I finally found a doctor that found out what it was and started helping me with it. And Sam moved from Atlanta back to Jacksonville. He moved back home. And he was like, dude, I came back. we got to keep this going. So we started playing again. And it was just me and Sam and a guy named Pat Lawley that started a band called the Diablos. And we had written a bunch of the songs that were on the first record. And a couple had extended from the time we were in Atlanta, like Ugly and things like that. But uh, one day, I remember the day I was going to quit music. I was about 26 years old and I had tried my whole life. And I was like, man, I'm, I'm giving up. You know, I, got a, I had an opportunity to go be at a turf school and start a new career. And the guy at the golf course wanted to pay for it. So I was, I was signing up for that the night that Fred Durst called. And I had never spoken to Fred at that point, but I had been friends with Wes and John and everybody played with Wes many times, you know, grown up with those guys, but I really didn't know Fred that much. But then Fred hit me up one night, the night before I was going to go to turf school and said that, uh, he goes, Hey man, you still writing sad songs? And I go, of course. He goes, well, I have a, he goes, we had gotten a record deal and Ross Robinson's in town. And he goes, I don't know what you're doing tonight, but maybe you could bring an acoustic over and play a couple songs for him. And I went to Fred's house and like I said, I really didn't know Fred that well, but Wes and them were there. So I felt comfortable and Ross was there and sat down and we all had a couple of drinks and I sat down and played ugly for him. And I think by the time I got to the end of the first chorus of ugly, Ross was like, stop. And I go, okay, that's it, man. Thanks dude. I appreciate the time. You know, I was like, whatever. He goes, no, 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 dude. He goes, he goes, I'm going to take you out to, he goes, you want to come out to Malibu and make a record? And <laughs> yes. That's amazing. Yeah. All yeah. Right. Yeah. That was it. And I honestly, like three weeks later, we were doing pre-production in Limp Biscuit's house. And a couple, a month later, we were in Malibu and the mountains at Indigo Ranch making a record at the most beautiful place ever. Yeah. And by the way, wasn't that drive up the, to Indigo Ranch? It's so fucked up. I remember having a bit of a panic attack. You know, like I beat that height thing like, by like zip lining in, in Rio. And but, uh, but anyway, it was pretty f crazy when you went around that hill. Crazy, dude. The crazy thing about that road, it's scary on its own if you're just going up it with a normal person, right? But I was with Ross Robinson. Yeah. He, he was in a Viper. He had just got it. And <laughs> Ross. It was either a BMW or a Viper he'd travel up there every day in, and he would just be full on molten metal. You know what I mean? Just yeah. pulling ass up there. And it was just scary. I was like, dude, I just got here. I'm going to die possibly. But I go, <laughs> I don't, I don't care. I'm in Malibu and I made a couple songs with Ross Robinson. So let's go. Oh, man. And you know that place? It was like Neil Young used to record a bunch of shit there and yeah. so many other people. And, uh, Corn did, I think, too. And you know, yeah, uh, was there right before us. It was Corn, then Limp Biscuit, and then Cold did our record, and then Slipknot came right after we did. Yeah, you know, it's funny because everybody, the whole idea was get groceries and get your booze and have everything up there already because you don't want to yeah. fucking go down that hill again like today. You know, like just we're going to do it one time. Or, or, you know. we do, man. We'd load up and just stay up there. And there, it was such a cool studio because it had a, a, a house, a little cabin kind of place. Where everybody lived. 
right out be- behind it. And you, the bands could stay in there. So you didn't have to travel far. You just get up, yeah. and up and Ross would make us, uh, it was the first healthy drink I think I ever had in my life. He would go out and we have an avocado tree farm and he would just pick avocados and he'd do this and mix it up with some protein stuff. And we'd have that every morning. And it was just a great day, man. It was a great experience. It was very cool. Yeah, man, that's, that's amazing. So, and that's when we met, right? You know, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. And then Fred had told me about you guys. Cause yep. I, you know, you know, Fred and I, you know, I love when we were, uh, you know, I was, I was on that album, Significant Other, and then also, you know, in that video, Rearrange and all, and all yeah. that stuff. Had some great fun experiences, you know. I love those guys. Like, uh, yeah. a really funny story about, like, getting off a plane in Jacksonville once, and John Otto's cousin going, because it was a Christmas holiday. Yeah. And it was... One of, the, one of the flight attendants had a kind of a hard on for me because there was a comedian whose name I won't mention that's really famous who had a family member die and he was, got on a plane with me and he had like Jack Daniels in his jacket. I'm like, you can give it. I go, you know, you can buy, the, you can buy that. On a plane, man, you know, mm-hmm. and he got so fucked up, you know, and, you know, like I said, man, we do, you don't judge anybody, you know, we've all been there. And, um, he, they end up like he ends up going in the back alley and throwing up all over the plane, right? And, and it's like one of the last Christmas flights, and the flight attendant wanted to have him like thrown in jail. Yeah. And I went; they brought him out in a wheelchair, and I explained. I said, man, "You know, he's a family member just died, man. He's having a really rough day." Well, she fucking hated me for that. And the funniest thing in the world was I wasn't drunk. I mean, I had a couple of drinks, but. I was listening to my fucking disc man and just ripping to some tunes and compilations I made. And she just had a, she was trying to start trouble with me. It was the weirdest thing I've ever, one of the weirdest things I've ever experienced. But then when she, I, I'm getting out of the plane, she's trying to have me arrested, right? I didn't do fuck all, man. And so the, the cops come and they go, the sheriff, and he goes, Matt, I know you didn't do shit. He goes, I'm John Otto's cousin. He goes, get the fuck out. Oh. Before anybody else shows up, <laughs> I got out of there and the Jacksonville, you know, you know, it was yeah, it was, you got lucky though because you know how, so dude, I know about Jacksonville, yes, I do, yeah, yeah, I know all about, yeah, you know, um, but you know, it's it's an amazing thing, you know, and you found an audience right away, Scooter, which was so cool, and then you know, the albums, you know, I mean, you think about it, you, you got like at least three gold albums, right? Or four? Yeah. I well, mean, we have we have two, and then we we have okay. a record for some things. So yeah, yeah. I mean, first ways to bleed on stage and Year of the Spider Man. I mean, you know, those records were amazing, and so it was the first it one. Pretty good, man. And yeah, it's a you know, we're so thankful for our fan base and the loyalty and the love that we get from them. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I've we've always given it right back to them. So I think that's what matters. You know, we we show them appreciation just like they show us. I, I the, like the last tour that we did, me and Sam were, you know, the whole crowd was singing every word and you could see the emotion of people getting, going through those times when they heard the songs and singing them. You could feel it, you know? And yeah. uh, it was it was a magical thing. And, you know, I, I, I was saying that we needed them as much as we knew they needed us at that time you know, on this last last tour and you know i think that just uh reaffirmed what we needed to continue cold and keep it going you know you know i, I tell you i when you were writing the songs i mean you know i started writing songs. I, I even came out and stayed at your house for a little bit and we were um i know when you were working on it i mean and your thing is is so genuine and real because i mean you, you just it's it's always got to be from the heart you know and it's oh and that's the thing that's been so cool and when you did that show in Jack's at the theater where I introduced you guys, people, your fans flew in the cold army from all over the world. All over the world. I, I, yeah, I was expecting, you know, people to, it was, it was implied that people come from all over the States, but then we had people from the UK, from um, Mexico, from Australia. It was, it was overwhelming with that. Like I didn't expect that. It was beautiful. You know? Yeah. So it's pretty amazing. And you know, people always ask me, they're like, all right, so Scooter wrote that song with Rivers Cuomo. I mean, I know we, we, you know, which is Stupid Girl, which is on Year of the Spider, which is yeah. such a great album anyway. 
And um, and that was a huge hit for you guys so in alternative and, and in rock. Yeah. But you, what? I mean, I got you have the real story about how you you wrote the basis of the song. And well, I we had the song with Cold. We had the guts of the song, the 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 chords and things. And um, I didn't really know what to do with it, man, because it was a little different variation of what we normally do with Cold, the more moody things, you know. So I was really having a hard time coming up with a hook or a melody for the way to sing on it. And I, I just didn't know what to do. And around the year of the spider time, when we were creating the record, we had a couple parties at our house. I think we were staying in old Beverly Hills somewhere in LA. And uh, we had a quite a big house and we were having these parties and we had, I think like Cypress Hill and Stained and River showed up that night too so i was like oh my god because rivers was one of my idols you know like that first time i heard the guitar yeah, you love the first weezer up right and pigger and that stuff you love it it was like they were my child they were my idols when i was a young man growing up and just the guitar sounds and everything weezer was probably one of my biggest fans and so for rivers to come over because he was connected with geffen so it kind of happened with that but we had kind of all you know started talking that night and it was funny because there was a bunch of metal people we had hip-hop guys there you know, like uh, and alternative you know, guys, uh, metal guys, right? Yeah, like the metal metal guys. Guys. and then we had Rivers, and R Rivers just blew everybody's mind because he all he talked about was heavy metal guitars for hours. You know, and, and everybody was like, "Dude, I had no idea." I was like, "That's how he gets that dope heavy guitar sound." He knows what he's talking about. And so, anyways, that that kind of started that, and then he had left, and you I know, talked he loves all to Van Halen. He loves it all. Yeah, yeah, he loves metal. And so the, I started talking to Jordan, uh, the, our, you know, owner of, the, of Geffen at the time. And I was like, man, I go, I have this song. I go, if we could send it to Rivers and just see what he feels about it. You know, we'd already met and everything was cool. And uh, he heard it and I said, it's kind of like a Weezer riff. And then I heard that he had said that, it, yeah, it's like Weezer on acid. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. <laughs> and I the whole you work on the song and it, he he decided to do it. So yeah, he, he had created the the lyrics, the verses and the stupid girl part of the song. And I think all I did was come up with the chorus, the she's going away, what's wrong with my life today part. Yeah. Yeah. So he had Great. all the other lyrics to the song. And we kind of did it not thinking that it was gonna be what it was. We were like, this is kind of a gimmick song. So but it's cool because it's with Weezer. So yeah. So hey, like, great song, man. I love that song. Right. It makes you feel good, man. You know, it's just one of those great. Yeah. So when we did it. We didn't we didn't anticipate it being what it was. And as soon as the label heard it, of course, they were like, this is the song. This is the one we're going to run with. And it was a little of a heart attack for me because of all the songs that the, the emotional things that we had written through Cold's career and stuff like that. I kind of wanted one of those songs to be the one first. But yeah. that's just the that's just an artist. Oh, like just got wicked and so many of the other yeah, songs. you know, but that's that's just me being young and whatever and uh, not knowing what Stupid Girl could have done. And when they were right. You know, that was that was one of the times the record labels were right. And it did well for us and it put us on another level and it elevated us and we got us. It was like number two or number, uh, it was number two on Billboard and radio charts and all that stuff. So it did well enough to get us, you know, we started doing the late night shows and all that stuff from that song. And it, and it launched, you know, it extended our career. It, it's the little things that happen throughout your career that just give you those extra moments that you can keep creating. You yeah. Know? Fantastic. You know, and, uh, we think about that, and you know, um, so you, you, all the so the records you did two gold records, right? But you never ever stopped writing and doing what you do, and your fan base is, like I said earlier, so devoted. Let's talk about the latest album because before we get into your favorite albums, because it's yeah. such a great record, and you know, you surprised me because you dedicated the album to me, man, and uh, when I got it, I got it in, uh, in the mail. And uh, it, it meant so much to me that you did that, you know, because, you know, when I got hit by the car and you guys, you guys came to the hospital. Yeah. I know how much it, I mean, it, it affect, you know, I saw how it affected you emotionally. I mean, this, you, you saw your friend. What, just you saying it again makes me emotional. Um, yeah, dude, the crazy thing about that is when it happened, I, you know, I, 
I heard about it on TMZ the next day. You yeah. know, it was weird. I heard it and I, I, I didn't believe, I was like stunned. I went in shock. Like I was like, what, just what? Matt's and Matt got hit by a car. Um, and of course we were in Temecula, which is about an hour and a half away from LA. And um, I got with Lindsay and soon, you know, we couldn't really get a hold of you because you had just, it just happened. And you know, yeah. we didn't know if you were okay or what was going on. So I stayed up like a couple of days straight. I couldn't, couldn't function really well. And then uh, as soon as we knew we were, you were able to have somebody there, we, me and Lindsay headed to LA and it was so good to see you, man, because dude, I, I was thinking I was going to walk into you like being all, you know, uh, you couldn't speak. You were just going to be all wrapped up. I had the worst visions in my head of what it was going to be like. And then I walk in and you have the worst scar on your head, but you're just like, <laughs> You're you're Matt. You know what I mean? You're like, hey man, what's yeah, up? Yeah, I know. Oh my God. And then we got me and Lynn's got all crying and started getting emotional. And then Allie and Brian were there. It was really cool, man. Yeah. It was, it was so good to see you that day. I can't even express. Yeah. You know, you know I mean, that's what got me through, man. Is you and my friend. I mean, people that love me. You know, like that was. I mean, I had the drive to fucking learn to walk again, but. It was you, man. Like you know, and and Allison and everybody, and Renee, you know, everybody who was there, man. You know, and all the people that came, and Lindsay, of course. Um, and you know what? It's fucking great to be alive, man. Even in times like this, it's the weirdest time in the world. But yeah, I'm so grateful that we're here. You know, and yeah. uh, and you know, I I just want you to know uh, that meant meant so much to me. And that was a very very emotional moment in my life when uh, when you were crying in the hospital because. Yeah, man. Yeah, you know, it, it's just weird because, you know, I had an aneurysm when I was 15, 14, and it was so fucking weird. And it was so alien, and I had fucking staples across my head on the other side of the head, and it's actually yeah. killed. But, uh, you know, we're fighters, man. That's what we do. You know, we yeah, fight. I think, I think you together probably had about 25 lives. Yeah, <laughs> two of us, right? It's true. Hey, so let's talk about the making of the latest album because there's so many great songs on that record, man. Yeah. And there's um, another Quiet Now, which you guys just put out a video for that yeah. I love. So let's talk about that song. Yeah, we did a song called Quiet Now. We were in, I was in Phoenix and we were doing the drums for the record in Phoenix. And we were going to bring it back and do the rest of the record at our houses. Um, and so we went out to the studio in Phoenix to do the record. And I had a good friend of mine, Matthew Kaiser. Um, he, he's, he's gone, he's had a, a hard life and he's done, you know, he's been through a lot. And I remember him, his father had passed while we were creating that record. And at the time I was just doing the music for the album. So I usually do the music first and then a melody comes or sometimes the music, the melody comes with the music and lyrics just appear from whatever, wherever they come from, they come to me. Um, so I, I remember the Kaiser sent me a picture, his father had passed and it was around the time of the Super Bowl, and I knew he was a football fan, and his it, we his father had lived in Phoenix where we were making the record, so he had to come out there to uh, go to the funeral. So when he did, we asked him to come and spend Super Bowl Sunday with us, and you know we made tacos and we tried to cheer him up, um, and we had a good day, we had a nice day. But then he sent me a picture of him and his father in the hospital. And it was him and his, him and his father holding hands. And uh, one of our friends, Dave Jackson, a, a great photographer, had edited it for him and sent it to him. And then when he sent it to me, I saw that photo. And I had this really beautiful music written. And I didn't really know what the song was going to be about. But when I saw that photo, I knew that uh, I started thinking of the the times where quiet now is basically about the, the things when, when someone passes, um, one of your family members dies, somebody close to you. It's the, it's that empty space, that sound that you don't hear anymore. Uh, you know, if your kids, you don't hear your little kids in the other room, you don't hear the wrestling around the house. Um, that was the quiet now part. So I, I, I remember how, when I was young and I had a lot of friends that committed suicide, how, painful not hearing them anymore was. so i know man I, yeah, you know you know and yeah, so man. Yeah. then i wanted to i wanted to 
I wanted to make people feel what that was like, like maybe what Matthew was going through when uh, he was telling me about his father. So sorry to get emotional. I get emotional. No, no that's how. That's why you and I are like fucking brothers, man. You know, yeah. we, we stay at your house and yeah. like why are we hanging? Right. Why, watch last week tonight with John Oliver and you know, like everything. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so you know it, it, when the. What, the song started coming out the day you went away from me, I, the, the, the little lyrics and stuff. And it just it matched perfectly to what Kaiser was going through. I think I tried to do him justice with a song that could possibly help him. And it may have hurt the first time you heard it, but I know that him knowing that I at least attempted to do something to help him. I think it helps him now, you know? Yeah, man, I, I will just tell you, you know, I want you to know, man, like, um, you and I have that connection where we're very emotional guys, man. And, and, uh, and you know, and that's the thing with Chris Cornell was the same deal, man. You know, like we, you know, we would, I remember when he had that stalker and I was the only person he would let back in the dressing room and we just talked about our emotions and dealing with everything. Yeah. yeah. I just know that, man, like I love that when you, you're bringing, when you're bringing something that people can feel, you know, like something that people can really relate to in a song like, and in the songs that you write. I mean, yeah, and you know, and that's and you are and you, I've always been completely fucking real and legit, and that's uh, you know why I've always loved you. Besides, you're smart and you're fucking cool. And we just have a good time, man. We I just it's very important to relax. Yeah. Like like that. That. when you but to translate to people not only to be real but to even it's like I, I spent so much time on every little word and and I think even if the words are simple, it's it's the delivery that you deliver the words with. Yeah. You know, yeah. that emotion of it. so every little thing counts and it's very important if you're going to be an artist i think you should you should really spend the time and not just put something out or just because they thought it sounded cool or think it sounds okay or something like that if it doesn't really hit you and doesn't really work then why the fuck put it out you know what i mean sorry for that Bob. and i love that man you know i gotta tell you you know i know that we're all like we're all like getting a little stir crazy obviously because I want my friends like you to tour. I want to be at shows. But the thing that's getting us through, besides the people we love, is the albums and the music that we've always loved, right? It's like the thing, it's it's always there. So I asked you to pick seven albums, you know, and I know seven's hard, but... It was really hard. It, and you know what was harder, Matt? It's because it's you telling me to pick seven records. Like, I think if a regular person just told me to pick seven records, I wouldn't have thought about it as much. But then I'm like... You're the vast, you know, you're the big encyclopedia of knowledge of every band and everything and all this. And I was like, okay, Pentel's asking me to pick seven records. Do I pick my seven favorite records? Or I'm just going to pick the records that I think kind of influence my musical career. You know, so they might not be my favorite records of all just time. Totally real. Like, you know, and that's the thing. I, you know, that when I heard them, they were pivotal on what changed my life, you know. So. Yeah, and you know, the first record you picked was Bauhaus in the flat field. Yes. And I, you know, I love that you did that because I was at that show in Jersey, in, in City Gardens in Trenton. The bartender was John Stewart. Yeah. And uh, wild. And they put it in the back room. In other words, it was like, it wasn't where the big stage was. Yeah. yeah. And, so, you know, and I'd known like Telegram Sam, I, I'd known the covers, like uh, Telegram Sam's T Rex cover. It was way before Ziggy, but shit was cool and they had a song Kick in the Eye that I fucking loved. It's oh, I love Kick in the Eye. Yeah, it was just so cool. And yeah. they were they you were know, really you know, so to me, man, right. the first time I heard Bauhaus, it was the it, in, in the flat fields. It was the um God, what's it, it that's the I forget the first song on there. But the bass line on that. Fear of Fear on there, or is it, uh, what else is on? It looks yeah, on that, right? right? Song on there, but I know the, the first one, the bass line on that song was the most grungiest, nastiest guitar bass sound thing I've ever really heard, you know, when I was a kid. I was probably 13, 14 years old. And to hear that, um, it just inspired me. And not only that, then I saw them, and I was like, they're like vampires. <laughs> With my and you remember when they were in the hunger, like with Bowie? That yeah, was, the, uh, yeah, right. The <laughs> fellow, the fellow. And we were like, "Wow, it was so cool." That's a great song. Peter Murphy, man, right? You know, 
It was so cool. So yeah, that whole thing, I really got wrapped up into Bauhaus for a long time. And uh, it was very influential on me going down. You know, I'd grown up on like Rolling Stones and Jimi Hendrix listened with my parents and stuff like that. So I really hadn't found my own music yet. And I think really listening to that, it was so anti all of that um, and just so cool. I think I, I was just like, I was, I, I got drawn to it and I, I got, you know, taken over by it. Yeah. And you know, um, Stigma of Mar Martyr was like the song on there. It was like That's super dark. Yeah. That I love. That, I mean, that no bass sound on Stigma of Martyr, I like that. That whole, yeah. it's just so, it was something, it's punk rock, but it wasn't, you know, it was. Yeah. Kind of like the, joke. the same thing. Well, they're not the same, obviously, but but they're also very dark. But there's there's all these other influences, and it's yeah. such a cool record, you know. Yeah. And it's funny because, you know, when you sent me the list, and I looked at, it, I'm like, oh, the spy in the cat. Like I hadn't thought about that song in what? very long. Oh, oh my god, I love that song. Such a beautiful song. It's a yeah. I re you know, it's um, all those early singles too, like the Passion of Lovers and yeah, and then all that stuff was. Well, I mean, the, the, what about Love and Rockets? You know, they they came from all uh, that thing, right? I love so, those albums. All those albums yeah, are so great. The whole yeah. thing was just uh, it was just cool. They were all superstars. Yeah, Kevin Haskins. I ran into him at the Idols and Fontaine's DC show, and that show was badass. And uh. He's like, Matt, he goes, how about you fucking accident? And, we were, and, you know, we were just catching up. And I told him, I go, man, I fucking love those Love and Rockets records. Well, I mean, maybe you and Daniel, you guys should at least talk about doing that again. But, I mean, you know, obviously, Bauhaus, we're going to play yeah. the Crew World Festival. Well, you know, we'll talk about that later. But, man, I love those guys. The funniest story about me and Peter Murphy is he comes in to do the morning show in New York. And at the end of the show, he comes up, he kisses me on both cheeks and goes, Matt, you've been kissed by a goth. <laughs> it's just brilliant. I mean, cut you so, up all those fucking songs. Indigo yeah. Eyes cover of Para Ubu's Final Solution. That shit was great. You but know? that's exactly what I would expect Peter Murphy to say. You know, I yeah, would him to say something cool like that. It was just yeah, awesome. yeah, you know, it's um, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, so you know, and, and so I'm looking through these records, which I love that you know stuff that you picked. And uh, you know, Interpol, our love to admire. I'm, yeah, what a great album cover, by the way, too. Oh, that album was crazy, right? Like, that's a shocking kind of album. You're like, what's going on there? Um, but yeah, it's a yeah. great The first song on that record, the yeah. that, that the one that I love to admire. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. No, Pioneer to the Falls is the first song on there. And I remember hearing that song. And dude, there, there was something that I lost in my music career throughout my life. When I was a really little kid, my dad used to listen to the Bee Gees a lot. Not the Bee Gees, the, well, the Bee Gees, but the uh, Beach Boys. And they had yeah. this guitar sound, you know? They had that uh, that surfer guitar kind of sound, right? Yeah, and, and Guns N' Devil played on most, a lot of those records, man. Yeah, you know? I loved great. that sound so much when I was a young kid. And, you know, I, I was a surfer throughout my teens, you know? I, I, it was a religion to me. So that's all I did. And it, the ocean was a big part of my life throughout, it still is to this day. I still really can't even write lyrics unless I'm driving along the coast. Um, I have to be close to the ocean when I do that. Um, so when I heard Interpol a few years ago, I remember just that sound of their guitars, you know? And yeah. I, I remember I saw, I was like, oh my, it just brought me back to the beach. It made yeah. me, but, but it, like a cool, dark beach, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I heard El Pen the El Pintor record and All the Rage Back Home. That song just blew my mind. And so they put a video out for it. And the video was about a, a just a guy surfing. And I go, I knew it, right? <laughs> yeah, I go, that's right. That's all right. I go, there was that connection. Like, it was the whole thing. And I found out Paul Banks had surfed a few times and stuff. He loved yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, Paul. Those guys are great. Carlos, who was the original yeah. bass player. I mean, I, you know, I love Carlos. Yeah. He's fucking yeah. hang out wild but um you know uh i also love the heimrich maneuver and on that record like, yeah. i know it's a single but when i moved to the west coast one of my ex ex-girlfriends was like i fucking never want to hear that song again because 
How are things on the West Coast? I love that. I love it. I oh, mean, if, that song when is, that starts uh, that song, it's brilliant. It's so great, you know? Yeah, see, they're like the, they're the epitome of cool to me. Intercultures, like the whole band. It's just the whole thing with the suits and the just the way they present themselves, uh, the cadences of their the the way they talk when they're doing interviews. The whole thing is just they're they're dope. They're a cool band. Yeah, I love those guys, man. Yeah. Speaking of guys that I love, man. Yeah, George, you guys. Manchester Orchestra is the next record you picked, and you know they're just you know uh, they're, they're such a great band and and incredible people. I had a big dilemma with that band, with picking that record, because it was either that this this was one of those records that where I was I loved alternative music throughout my life and I loved heavy music, too. And Weezer was one of the first bands to, you know, bring put that mix together with the heavy guitar sound, but the cool alternative style. And it was either a Weezer record or Manchester record orchestra record. And I remember when I first heard the Virgin song. For Manchester Orchestra and the little kids singing da, 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 that melody and then all of a sudden the silence and then there's the heavy the heaviest guitar sound of all time comes in and it just blows up it's like an explosion I just go immediately one of my favorite bands you know yeah so, great. Um, have you met or seen them live yet uh, you know we uh, a couple of few years ago they were playing at a club close to our house, about an hour away. And me and Lindsay, my daughter and her mom went to see them. And it was probably one of the first concerts that I had been to in 10 years. I, I, Cause I don't really go out. I just kind of a really reclusive guy, but I had to, my daughter's, you know, I love Manchester orchestra and me and Cameron, my daughter always listened to hope and Leia. Um, we listened to that record religiously, so we loved them. And I found out they were playing, so we went to the show, and we get there, and a Foxing was opening up for them, which was just even better because they're such a dope new band. Yeah. Um, so we get to the show, and Lindsay was with her boyfriend at the time, and I was with Cameron, and we're sitting around waiting. We're an hour and a half before the show starts, and all of a sudden, Cameron, we had eaten a little stuff at the bar there, and then she had started getting a little sick. And I was like, oh, no, what's happening? So she had gotten kind of food poisoning while we were sitting there. So we had to, right before the show started, we had to, to leave. So I didn't get to see him. I, Lindsay had stayed there and watched him. So it was a great show. But, yeah, I missed that show. Um, but I'll see him again. They tour a lot. You so. know, and you know what? You, you hear about that show they did in a the cave? Like they did at, they, like completely underground? That's, that was just the cool thing. Hear that, but that sounds amazing. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it, my friend said it was amazing. You know, the guy who um, used to run the alternative station in Jacksonville, yeah, it was part of, like, his marriage. Like, he wanted to get married, and his honeymoon was going to that show underground because he loved Manchester. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah, my friend Aaron. It's a great story. Amazing. You know, he's such a good dude. Anyway, so the next one you picked, you and I love Soundgarden. There's no question about it. Yes. And... Everybody has a favorite album, and you pick Louder Than Love, right? So well, I picked Louder Than Love because that was the first record that I heard from Soundgarden. You know, it was when I was, me and Sam were kids. I think we were, what, 19 or something, maybe, 18. Yeah. Um, and he had pulled up in his Jeep, and we were listening to Louder Than Love, and then we saw the concert. We had a DVD of it, and we put it in, and when I saw it, it was, it was life-changing because – that's exactly what we already were. Like Grundig, we had named our band Grundig. We, we played music like that. Like we played slow, grungy. We thought we were like the Southern Black Sabbath or something, you know, with a way worse. Yeah. Than was me. Um, but when we heard Soundgarden, then it, it, everything clicked. I was like, oh shit, we got to get to Seattle. Like this is, it, this is what we do. <laughs> and it's, it's all happening over here. We're in the wrong place. Um, but yeah, but that was an emotional moment. It was a magical thing too, because it just, you know, it, it, everything sound, you know, the super unknown, every record that they made after that was very, I love the records, all of them, you know, yeah, it was amazing. It was a lot. Bungie, oh, yeah. Cool. The way they just played slow and just powerful, but then with Chris Cornell's vocal, it was angelic. 
just elevated everything. You know, and not to get, not to not say that, you know, Mud Honey, Tad, Mother Love Bone, Pearl Jam, all those bands that came from that area were very integral in what we did. Pearl, you know, the whole thing was just uh, we felt like we were at home, but we were so far away from them. Yeah, and it was great because it was uh, it was a good time. I like I liked hearing a lot of guitars. Don't yeah. I love synths too. I love you know. I love, yeah, me too. And I grew up on. I was a synth guy. All these, a lot of the bands I picked earlier have synths, you know. But yeah, I mean, just, you know, everybody from Gary Newman to like OMD and Soft Cell and I mean, yeah. I, uh, the Garden was like it was like new blood. You know what I mean? When you first heard it, you were like, "Oh, this is this is new. This is cool. It's dope." So you know, I gotta ask you. So the next one is a band that you know we've been always. You know, become great friends, and uh, funniest thing in the world was before I got hit by the car, I was climbing those Hollywood stairs, 180 up, 180 down, just yeah. fighting a little way and trying to, like, I get to the top, and there's Ian walking his dog. <laughs> he hadn't seen me in a while. He goes, he goes, Matt, you, you trying to scare me? What the fuck are you fucking doing the stairs? It was funny. Uh, we, you know, I love him. You know, he's, and uh, Billy, I see quite, quite often. But uh, you picked Dreamtime. Originally, you said li Live at the Lyceum. Which one well, do you want to pick? It, it, honestly, it, but you know, it, the, it was off the Dreamtime record, really, and it was more Southern death cultish kind of stuff before the cult became. Like Eric Walker, and you know, yeah, uh, that kind of stuff like that. But the Resurrection thing, Joe, <laughs> yeah, it was great. Yeah, you know? the problem, it was it was your fault, kind of, because it was MTV that played that concert. It was the they played live at the Elysium concert every Saturday night. There was a concert on MTV, and it was random things. Live at Elysium came on one night. And it was the cult before the love record and all that. And dude, it was the coolest thing. It was probably the still to this day. I watched it the other night when I was going through it again, just to see the video. I go, is this available now? So I Googled it and watched the live at Lyceum concert again. And just the beginning of that concert, the where they do, I think 83rd dream is the first song and it's just so dark and cool. And, uh, you know, you hear the crowd chanting, they're doing some kind of like a, I don't know if it was some kind of spiritual soccer chant or what was going on. Yeah. But it was UK. It was weird, yeah. yeah, it was in the UK and it was some weird rumbling witch sounding haunting thing going on in the background as the cult was coming on stage. And then when Ian Asbury comes out on stage, and this is before he had his really long black hair and all that stuff, he was very punk rock alternative. All of them were. And he comes out with a bottle of wine and he's pretty shitty. You know, he's pretty messed up and he just sits there and just goes, they go through the songs and dude, you could just tell that they're just having a great time, but it was so, such a cool, eerie, wicked experience. I mean, it was like, I imagined like back in the day, I was all into the darker things. So I was like, this, it's like a bunch of witches on stage and they're all together and they're playing instruments and it was, it was beautiful. So from that moment on, I just fell in love with the cult and I became like, the, they're through the love record and even with electric even i know they changed the sound with that i still i wrote it hard for a while with the cult. yeah man you know and sonic temple there's great stuff and you know it's funny i love those guys man and um i told, I told ian and, and billy i would come introduce them this was me when i was, i think i was still doing south by southwest live eight <laughs> hours a day for direct tv yeah. and it was so on, you know, like I mean, I, you know, yeah, I'll fucking that. If it's about music, I'll do it for 24 hours. Um, and I introduced him on stage, and then I'm standing on the side of the stage, and you know, Ian, he doesn't give a shit what he says, and I love him for that, but it was also the funniest thing ever. He goes, Hey, you fucking indie rockers, Matt Pitt will die for your fucking sins. You know, like it was just so funny. And then he goes, Did you just hear that? I'm like, I don't know. He said something a little more rude, like, Are you indie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know what? I love yeah. indie rock. I'm so I'm like, you know me. I'm a total nerd. I mean, that's what I, I mean. I love all kinds of music. I, you know, I yeah. was wearing a neutral hotel shirt the other. You know, like I love everything. I um, always have. You know, so but that was pretty, pretty. That was pretty wild because <laughs> I was like, holy shit, man! But he just man, give a man. Fuck, oh, you know? oh, I love him. You know, he's he's been a, he's been a good guy. You know, he uh. We spent a lot of time together in New York, you know. Yeah. You know when when he lived there, and uh, he and I were both going through a breakup at the same time, and it was really important. You know, the next album you picked is The Cure, one of my favorites, man. The Head on the Door. Yeah. And 
I fucking love that record because I mean it opens with In Between Days. Yes. Which which may be my favorite cure song ever. Um or so I don't know. Songs, the walk uh, is, uh, you know, I mean, there's so many I love. Yeah, you know? I was, I went through that record the other day too because, like I said, those were moments in my life. These records were moments in my life that were pivotal to me. So when I first heard, even though that was the first Cure record I heard, like Standing on the Beach came out or was out, and I just didn't know about it, but I got it right after that, right after, yeah, right after that, and that's when the Forest and all those songs, and I just go, oh yeah, this is just the best band that's ever been created. So, but when I first heard the head on the door, it was the, the song between days and then the baby screams. When I heard the baby scream song, I was like, oh no, this is yeah. other level. And it was yeah, just, a night like this is like night always like, been. But, right? yeah, like, and that was another thing. A <laughs> night like this was crazy because it was one of the cool alternative bands doing a total love song, kind of. You know what I mean? It was just kind of. Yeah. They were one of the darker bands, but then it, they to write this beautifully structured love song that's timeless, you know, to this day, that song still has its weight and it's perfect. It's just a beautifully crafted song. Yeah, it, it is so great. And I love Push um, yes. and the Blood. Like that record is just, yeah, it's yeah, one of my favorite. It's a record. very cool record. That, that record, out of all the records, I, that record has a lot of different sounds on it. It's got the Dark Cure it's got the strummy cure, the poppyish cure. Like that's, I think that's a full yeah, on. Most of me is on there, right? So it's like oh, everything's on. Yeah, it's got every every different cure faction is you know elevated in that record for sure. You know, I love that record. You know, Robert's always been really super nice to me, man. And you know, the first time I met him, I went to interview him. I called from the college radio station. You know, I would use their phones because. Long distance in that time would be fucking, you know, so much money. So I called Chris Perry, their manager who ran also, you know, produced the jam and, you know, ran fiction records. I like, Chris, I, I want to interview the cure, man. I'm, you know, I'm coming to this Rutgers college radio station. He goes, okay, well, give me your tape recorder. So me and my, one of my best friends, Robbie Shitner, who also loved the cure, uh, it was right after the Love Cats. So it was like, you put out these three pornography and then those three singles. Let's go uh, to bed. Pornography. Uh, the Walk and the Love Cats. Yeah. And I witnessed a press conference. And I'm talking about like respectable magazines and newspapers. And I yeah. saw some of the stupidest fucking people asking the dumbest fucking questions ever. Yeah. And I and, and you know, but there's a lot of great journalists. So I wanna like, like say that because you know, I'm friends so many of them and I love them, but and they're music freaks. But that day, the people that were interviewing the cure, yeah, Lil Poe and Robert were sitting there at a table, and he was getting fucking unbelievably irritated. They're like, why are you so depressed? And like all this fucking shit. Yeah. So I was a part of the press conference. So I'm sitting there, with my friend, and the road manager walks up to Robert after these people leave, and I can tell he's so fucking pissed off. And he goes, and they go to, hey, Chris said. That guy, Matt Pinfield, is here to interview. And Robert takes a milk carton and crushes it in his hand. And he throws it across the room. Oh. And I'm like, oh, fuck. What, I, what am I going to do here? And I go, uh, I remember the Cult Hero single. And I walked up behind Robert. I said, Robert, listen, man, I don't really, I don't give a fuck about the cure. But can we talk about your mailman? And he went, it would just, it changed the game, the whole mood. Because they made this record with their fucking mailman, which is funny. Like, I dig you and I'm a cult hero. From that moment on, like, the mood rose. And it was so much fun. And we, we just yeah. had a great time. So it was just like finding that connection. You know, it was, uh, you know, a college kid, you know. And, but I loved them. I saw those tours, like, 17 Seconds and and uh, Faith. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, a Forest was, was just, like, insane. Yeah, I, 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 I saw I saw none of those tours to this day. I've still never seen the Cure in concert, which is insane because it seems like every time that they're on a tour, I'm in a different area or doing a record or something like that. And I've just never been blessed. Yeah. You know, I love them so much. There's actually a picture of me and them at, on a 120 minute site, like facing the other way on the wall. Um, you know, Robert, well, he goes, well, they were doing that. Like they were doing a, a kind of grateful dead thing where they change the set every night. And he goes, well, what do you want to hear? Tonight, you come on the show and go, how about the perfect girl from Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me? It was great. I don't have to play anything on it. It's all keyboards. And it was really funny. But I will just say, 
Went to the show here. They, they did in Pasadena. Ended up getting, you know, on the stage. It was me, Peter Katz, who you know well. Yeah. You know, and his son from Deftones. Yeah. And he was like singing every lyric, man. And it was just, it was a really, really so, long time, man, you know. And my leg was so fucked up, so I was like sitting on a road case you know, on the side of the stage, which was beautiful. But uh, long history with those guys. So the next record you picked is one of my favorite records. And I was just talking to a friend of mine in Dublin Saturday night because I was just, he and I, he played for John Cale's band of all days. Friends, you know, he's younger than everybody in the Patty Smith group, but you know, they're all from like my area. Mm -hmm. And um, we were, I was explaining to him that when I was interviewing you two for all, you can, all That You Can't Leave Behind in their studio, I looked out the window at the bog and it was where they shot the Gloria video. And uh -huh. I'm sitting there interviewing Bono and the Edge. And I'm like, holy shit. Because Gloria was like, I loved October. Which, like, you know, they, nobody that gives that album credit. Yeah, I dude. Fall what, down, fire. Gloria, that's the song, though. I mean, when I was a kid and MTV played Gloria, that was the battle cry. Like, I was like, these guys are out on a bog. Yeah. In the middle of wherever. Just killing it. And the first time I heard the Edge play guitar was on Gloria. You know, and just... Dude, his style with the delays and everything like that, that was very that was a pivotal moment for Cold because that changed everything. I wanted everything to have delay on it since then, and I still do. Yeah. 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 I mean, he's, he's such and a like I told you when I when I met Sam that I will follow was the first song that I really knew how to play on guitar. Yeah. Really just a couple of strings. And I, I, I think I only had four strings on the guitar at the time, but I could play that song. And um yeah, man, that that whole thing changed my life. And there was something so uh, a contained rebellion in that music, you know, like there was that they, they they were very rebellious, but it was so perfectly formatted. The songs. Yeah. You know, it wasn't I like down. you yeah. remember I fooled down with, with that piano intro. I love that fucking song so much, man. Like yeah. I just that record rejoice. It's a record they don't, for some reason, they don't have the love for it that the rest of us do. But yeah. uh, but I, I still love and stand by October, man, all the way. Yeah. But Under a Blood Red Sky was, you know, that one where they had I Will Follow, Gloria, they, the whole thing. Like that Party concert. Girl, which they wrote in 15 minutes. And I love that song so much. Yeah. And that was another thing. Like that was another MTV concert. One of the Saturday night things. Like I saw that concert and I was just like, ah, it was, it was impressive. Man. And it was life changing. Yeah. Um, they, were, they were seriously, we just such a great band in every way. And you know, you know what's weird about your show right here, Matt, is what? That, dude, it's crazy. Cause it's like me and you are just chatting. Like we always do. Yeah. We're just talking like we always do. <laughs> That's what's so cool. About you know, this is a, this is a real deal thing. Yeah, you know, I, I, you know it's funny just, I don't feel like we're you know being broadcasted right now, but we are. So it's right. kind of it's kind of funny that we're just doing that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's and I love it, man. And yeah, Under Butter Sky, Party Girl always made me feel. It was it used to be called Trash Trampoline and the Party Girl, and it was a B side of a single that I loved because I played on college radio called A Celebration. Which, you know, like, I, in, I guess in retrospect, they don't love the song. But, I mean, it was great. And Party Girl, Steve Lillywhite and Bono both told me, like, wrote it in 10, 15 minutes. It's like they were in the studio. It was just like, you know, it was, and it's so good. It's got such a great feel, you know. And, and, and no. the best version is the version from Under the Blood Red Sky, you know. It's just. Yeah. They have Party Girl. We have Stupid Girl. I get it. It's one of yeah. those. It's just a thing. Oh, great, man. You know. You know, Scooter, man, I, I want to thank you so much for doing this with me. And I want you to know, like, you know, I, oh, like, you you know, I know we were, go, you know, we were just like, I wish I, I could see you right now in a venue. I wish everybody was on tour, but we just, we'll fight yeah. through it like we always do, right? We'll get there, man. If everybody just hangs in there and follows the rules right now, I think that's the best thing to do. And I know it's hard. It sucks. But, you know, we're, we all got to, we all have to team up together to make this happen so we can get out there faster and, you know start this up again you know yeah. just get our lives back yeah oh god i know and i know it's gonna be rough because i know it's really there are gonna be major issues with the economy which is why we're doing this for music cares and just trying to help out everybody like yeah it's like, awesome man. people knew and they do know i think they know now but 
how much goes into a band on tour or everything that you know like it's just it's a lot all people's lives it's uh, it's so you know it's it's so important and uh, you know everybody everybody's having a rough time but this yeah. is why you just have to buckle down and stay as strong as possible man you know even though sometimes we're we're like you get really bummed out and you know but the music gets us through and that's what i'm doing here with this thing in a lonely place which is a great name, by the way, right? I mean, you don't even have to Told me you can name the other night on the phone. I think we talked at like three in the morning and you said the name and I immediately was like, yes, that's it. Like, keep that name. Yeah. It's the perfect name. Yeah, and then my friend Cliff Galbraith, you know, I've been friends with forever. He yeah. uh, he made that logo and it, I love it because it looks like the man with the golden arm, like Frank Sinatra, yeah. he's the yeah. same. Every kind of reminded me of a Split Ends cover or something. I don't know if I... Yeah. Remember. Uh, the, we love split ends. Different. Speaking of that, Neil Finn, man, all those that guy. I love I think we've talked about split ends before our affinity for split ends. Yeah, but. you know, my oldest daughter, Jessica, we used to drive in a car and her and I would sing History Never Repeats and yeah, do that dude. harmony together. We would just sit uh, and we would, you know, I, it was so awesome. I love dirty. Just a beautiful moment. Uh, all, all every split in record is one of my favorite records. Yeah. So that was, that was, I, 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 I put that on the list, but I had removed that for I think Bauhaus House because I think Bauhaus House was more pivotal for me. But Split Ends was definitely a, a defining band for me. Also, they were they were brilliant. Yeah, you know I love them. Scooter, thanks for doing this today, man. And I want everybody to remind everybody to check out the new video for Quiet yeah. Now. Yeah. yeah. Think- you know, and I'd like to give props to my buddy, Patrick Hooven from Ghost Motel. You know, he's a great artist. He had a song called Hush that I saw with just a ghost. That his band was playing. The ghost was traveling through really slowly. I saw the video. I was so inspired by it. I, was, I contacted him to help me direct the video. Um, so he did his part in Germany with the girl. And then my, me and my buddy Dave Jackson shot my part here in the States. And they both uh, did such a great job that, you know, it came together perfectly and seamless. So I'd like to thank those guys for making that video for us. And it's a very emotional video and it connects with a lot of people right now because of, you know, it's basically- It's quiet now. It's Yeah, she's grieving over the loss of her child, except for she's confined to a space, you know? So I think a lot of people, even if you haven't suffered a loss like that, just being in that situation and the whole uh, vibe of the song and the content it definitely relates to what's happening right now. <clears throat> that wasn't a COVID cough. Yeah, no, but yeah, yeah, no, I, mine neither, you know? Well, yeah. No COVID cough. Coughs. No COVID cough. I haven't coughed at all on this show. It's a pretty it's surprising, you know what I, I mean? Yeah, I haven't coughed in a while, but I'm coughing yeah. today. Listen, Scooter, it's so great to have you on, man. And Oh, wait, we didn't even talk about quickly. I know, because yeah. I know they're trying to get me to rap. Yep. But I want to say, you got the number one active rock song in the country right now, in the U.S., through Billboard and everywhere else, yes. with Breaking Benjamin. Just talk to me about that. That's the last thing we got to talk about. We, me and Ben reconnected. We were rehearsing for the t- Broken Human Tour. Uh, Nick, our guitarist, are good friends with him. And, you know, we used to play with Ben back in the day uh, when we first started out. Ben had called us down. They were doing a big show. It was like 20,000 people. And he called us down. We were just rehearsing after eight years for our first time rehearsing to go on tour we had just gotten there like a week so we really hadn't got into it yet and then ben calls and goes hey he goes i heard you guys are up on the mountain why don't you guys come down to the show and play uh just got wicked and you know i I, at first i thought he was asking me to come down his band was going to play and i was just going to get on and sing the song you know like a a normal thing an invite to a show would be like that um but no he wanted to stop in the middle of his set and bring cold out onto the stage (laughs) <laughs> but it just got wicked and he was going to sing it with us but it was definitely a, a, a strange thing and I, I didn't feel we were prepared so i was like absolutely not we're not doing that that's insane I'm not doing it and you know nick and Lindsay, they talked me into it and the next day we hit him up around noon and we we're like all right dude we're just going to come do sound check and see how it sounds and we came and did sound check and we still fucked it up but it was okay um we were like you know what it is what it is. Let's just get up there tonight and do it. And when we did, it was a, we had a great, uh, you know, reception with all the fans that had saw we were there and we played and it, it, you know, rekindled mine and Ben's relationship. And we had started talking a lot again. And uh, we just sit on the phone for hours at night talking. And I said something about him doing a song with cold one day. And he goes, dude, you know what? He goes, I'm doing this acoustic record. He goes, and I have like Spencer from under oath. I have Adam. 
uh, Lacey's on it. There's a lot of cool people that I admired throughout my life. He goes, you're one of the biggest inspirations. He goes, he goes, it was a bunch of uh, older B Breaking Benjamin songs. He goes, but there's this one song called Far Away. And he goes, no one's ever heard it before. And he goes, and I couldn't find the right person to sing on it. He goes, but then when we reconnected, I knew it was you. And he goes, it'd be perfect. So he goes, I'm going to send it to you and you let me know what you think. And he goes, I know how you are. He goes, you're going to, he goes, you have to feel it to do it. So if you don't love it, just let me know. And he sent me the song and it was just him doing it. And I think by the time the end of the first chorus, I just, I pressed stop. I was like, it's beautiful. Right. So I called him. I said, dude, we have to, we have to do this. Um, and yeah, we recorded me and Nick uh, was there and he recorded us. Uh, he recorded me doing it in a couple of nights at the studio that we were rehearsing for the tour at. I sent it to Ben and his producer and yeah, it worked out, man. And it sounded great. So it was very cool. And I'm very thankful for Ben and his whole band and his whole team for setting that yeah, up. Number one, I'm really, I was so happy, man. I just seeing your name on the chart. Right. Breaking it was cool. With Scooter Ward, I just was, I was so pumped about it, man. You know, you know. So what family. better what better to be there with than Breaking Ben? I mean, there's they're all such sweet people in a nice outfit. You know, the whole yeah, thing Wilkes, is just, Pennsylvania, man. You know, it's uh, it's wild. You know? Yeah, you know where they're from. I remember. Yeah. Like, I know we, we got to go, but right, I remember right. when I was a kid, there was a major flood, a uh, like a dam burst in in Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania. And our old next door neighbors who we were best friends with, you know, lost their yeah. house and people lost everything. I mean, there, were, there were coffins being because of the water pressure, like going down the yeah. street from the cemetery. Pretty crazy shit. Right. And I, uh, I just remember going to that town and helping out this family uh, called the Eastons that we were, we were tight with. And I'll, I'll always that town will always sadly for me, be, I'll remember the flood and everything that people lost. But you know what? Yeah. We band together, and we, you know what? We were digging out, like helping them with a, you know, with HUD, you know, helping them get their house together, because that's the way my dad was, yeah. mom and like family. And I remember none of the album covers because of the water survived, but there was a pile of vinyl, and we were listening to like Credence, and it was just fucking cool. Yeah. You know, it was a long time ago. But you know, uh, that town, the town though, that town produces so much great music. You know, like yeah, we said, uh, one of the. University Drive, for instance, is one of the bands that we took out on tour. The T-shirt I'm wearing right now, uh, Ed and Angelo and those guys, they, the, their music was just, it was a beautiful record they had written. And, uh, you know, I'd started, we had a, a, a director do the Without You video from Wilkes Bar, and his name was Billy, and his band was insane. They have, a, they have something going on there right now. That whole, I was just talking to Ed about it the other day. There's something about the indie bands there that yeah. it's, it's happening right now. You know, yeah, it's, like, it's a cool place. It's good. It's good. Good. People, man. It's good yeah. People. Yeah. Love music and want to be creative. Scooter, thanks for doing this today, man. I love you, brother. And, you know, there's nothing better than hanging out with your friends, talking about music. No, and, no. and, you know, for everybody else that's watching, we, you know, we hope you're entertained because that's what we do. We love it. And, you know, it's just, uh, but it's getting us through. It always does. You know, that's the most important thing. And music cares. And we are here, and you know, and Linda Perry and Carrie Brown and Chris Trevero and Nate and Aaron and everybody who's working on this. Rip Krim, everybody's helping out, man. You know, I feel uh, I'm and Renee Mata. Uh, you know, I'm just feeling very, very grateful that I'm that I'm able to do this. And uh, and man, you know, it's just like it's like you and I hanging on your couch. You know, I know. <laughs> I was saying it's it's strange, but it's really cool. I like it a lot. So yeah, I felt comfortable through the whole thing. I didn't feel like I was being interviewed. I thought we were just talking like we normally do. Well, it's, 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 but I love you, brother, and I'm oh, I'm, I'm glad you're I'm glad you're still alive from your wreck and everything. Okay, I'm glad yeah. you're doing really well. And yeah, the new yeah, show. Great. I, I, gratitude is everything, man. You know, uh, um, yeah. been through a lot of shit in my life, as you know. We, you know, all, all of us have. But, but I'm I'm grateful to be here, and this is just another part of the journey you know <laughs> it's just that it's the first time you're really isolated but it's fine because you know we'll get through and at least okay. this contact you know being with you here today and you know working with uh music cares and the we are here people it's just uh keeps you going you know most it's important awesome. but i love you brother so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get going man and uh 
And uh, this will be up online. You know, I mean, it's, it was li it's live right now, but it, okay. it will be available for people to watch. Okay. And, uh, cool. and I appreciate it so much, Scooter. Congratulations on that number one record, man. And Dude, uh, you, man. we will be in an elevator again. Yes. In the future. We got we to gotta get another dope picture together like that. Yeah, that picture was like a recreated that one. That was in really our, good. In our suit jackets, man. That yeah. picture is great. From the Grammys two years ago. It was awesome. Nice. It was just it's yeah. one of my favorite shots. All you right, know, brother. Well, and and David Starkey, we got to give him some love, too, always. You know, him yes, and always. All my Jacks brothers. All right, well, listen. Take care, Scooter. I want to say to everybody, thank you for watching. You know, uh, tomorrow we have Des Rocks. Danny is is great, um, a young artist that I, I just love very much. And then on Friday, we have Mark Foster of Foster the People. The week after, we have Joey from the Pixies, Holly Weinberg, AWOL Nation, Youngblood. We're just going to keep doing it. We're just, you know, as long as we are here, we'll just, we'll just keep bringing great people on and talking about their favorite record. So thanks so much for watching. Keep the music in your heart. It's called In a Lonely Place. And I'll be back with you tomorrow at 4 o'clock Pacific, 7 o'clock Eastern. Thanks for watching.